Hi, everyone. I'm Natarajan Krishnaswamy. I'm an open data ambassador. And I got into open data, I guess. There was this talk at the Museum of Mathematics where Jen Chase, she was the head of Microsoft Research Northeast, and now she's the dean at Berkeley. And she was talking about how they could find drug, like, drug discovery targets, uh, signaling pathways, proteins, and things like that were neither overexpressed nor underexpressed. But if you target them with drugs, you can stop cancer growth, kill cancer cells, stuff like that. And the fact that you could figure this out just from data is just utterly magical. So I, got, I then I decided to get a master's in data science, did that, and started volunteering around the same time. It's been quite a journey. Love it. Love open data. Love sharing the passion for like community empowerment through open data, stuff like that. So it's, it's very exciting to see such a full room today. So thanks everyone for attending. My name is Laura Hecklinger. I'm another Open Data Ambassador. Um, this is my first year being an Open Data Ambassador. I work for the MTA doing data management and volunteer here on the side. And yeah, I'm excited to work with everyone. I think Open Data is amazing, but it's really only as powerful if people know how to use it and utilize it and access it. So and know I'm excited. it exists. And know it exists. That's <laughs> number one, know that it exists. So I'm excited to share all of that with you all today. The Open Data Ambassador Program started in the run-up to Census 2020, a partnership between the Queen's Public Library, Beta NYC, whom we all know, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, build up data literacy, awareness of open data, specifically New York City open data, and also to drum up interest in the census to increase participation in Census 2020, because Queen's has had the most hard-to-reach, hard-to-count communities in the country uh, here where we it's frustrating that we have that problem, but yeah, you may have heard that like New York City response rates were pretty high. We uh, like in fact increased our population by almost a million people. So it's uh, a fairly successful census. So we're not going to take credit for that, but it didn't. So the the program has continued. They devolved. It's a uh, train the trainers kind of program. So they actually had presented the almost these same slides to us, and we had practice sessions presenting them to each other and to some of the organizers. And hopefully, you all will be comfortable enough to do the same. We'll share the slides after the event. So that's the Open Data Ambassador Program. I mentioned the parties that created it. They, like I said, the original one also had uh, Queens Public Library, and uh, this one has expanded this. Anyway. So. New York City Open Data is a, like you heard maybe during the uh, keynotes that it's a, a program to make information about the operation of the city automatically available. And it's interesting to see how we got there. It's a transparency initiative in a lot of ways, as well as being something functional and usable. And a lot of uh, it's, I guess, in the same lineage as efforts like progressive era reforms after Tammany Hall and uh, Boss Tweed and uh, a lot of very public corruption to let people see what the government's actually doing. The city record, which nowadays is online at the link at the bottom, it lists like basically every like significant public act from hiring to bills that the city does. It was a big change to have all of that be public. These have been like the early paper ones have been scanned, but like I said, nowadays it's available online. The next really big jump was rather than you see what the government wants to tell you, uh, you can request information and they have to give it to you unless they have a good reason not to. And that started as Freedom of Information Act in the U.S. in, I believe, 67. And various states, including New York State, passed their own versions. Some are called like sunlight laws, like in Florida or but here it's the Freedom of Information Law, or FOIL, and it was originally passed in 1974. It was completely replaced in 77 and it has been amended uh, on and off through the years. I think the latest was in 2008. Not only do they generally have to provide requested information, they have to give you a reason if they refuse. And there are a number of statutorily permitted reasons. They may redact the information and stuff like that. But one kind of interesting thing that came out recently-ish was the uh, FBI had sent a letter encouraging Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to commit suicide. <laughs> Hoover's FBI was quite a thing. Yeah, so that's one of the things that FOIA has made possible. In New York State, like I requested some records from the DMV about gender marker changes, which is pretty fascinating too. So 
the problem, it was a huge step forward, but it was still on an as requested basis. Individuals could request information from the government and it would be provided to them. So the problem was uh, you had to know what you were looking for. You had roughly, you have to describe the records you're requesting. Generally, there are Agencies are not required to pr produce new records. They don't have to, for example, have an analyst do some new aggregations or calculations on your behalf. It's only stuff that's already been produced or is easy for them to give you. And that really only helps if you know what they have. New York City uh, made this a lot easier for people starting in 93 by publishing a directory of what uh, data sets each agency has and who to contact to find out more about it. And so that was a big step forward, but it's still in the FOIL, FOIA framework. You ask for data, you get it. And the huge shift happened uh, thanks to a lot of advocacy by a lot of different community and government actors to switch to a model of public by default. Each Agency in the New York City government is obliged to publish their records that conform to the open data definition, uh, which we can talk about a, a little later, omitting things like personal information, private information about people, stuff like that in certain, most circumstances, that and make them like publicly available to everyone on the web. And that's the, the U.S. government has done something similar. Many localities and states do this, but a lot of the time it's via executive orders or policies. New York City is a little unusual in that it's actually the law, so it's not subject to the whims of administrations. The actual text of it is uh, Title 23, Chapter 5, if you want to look that up. Uh, you can find that in the New York City Administrative Code, which has all of the amendments applied as single current uh, administrative code text. So what does this mean? What is an agency, like what, how does this kind of mosaic or tessellate across the actual physical city, the people in it, the flows of information, goods, money? It's quite a thing. So if you think about it, it's like, what is a city? A city is like this incredible complex system and a city government is an interesting, like, rich subsystem of it with a lot of its own functional subsystems. So here we see Department of Sanitation, we see transportation, we see buildings, uh, taxine and limousine commission. Each of these have, as part of their operation, they consume data and they produce data. And it's not necessarily what they're for, but it's like the grease or the exhaust even in some cases. And it tells you what is, in, it gives you a view of what is happening in the city. It gives you a view of what is happening in each of these agencies. And it's possible to have some really exciting combinations of those. I had mentioned before that like something has, like the things that agencies have to make public are open data as uh, under the open data laws definition. And one of the big important, like fundamental building blocks there is that the information has to be machine readable to start with. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean, it means not things like historical maps, even if they're interesting. Even if you scan the sort of thing that is, falls under the definition tends to be more like tabular data. If it has geographic information, it has to be stored in some ways like a, uh, if you're familiar with GIS systems, as like a geographic record in a table. So uh, it can't be like certain kinds of private and confidential. It can't uh, release things that are not legally public, that are not required to be kept confidential. And this isn't always what you'd expect because as the example here shows, every city employee's salary is public information. It includes their name, their job, the agency they work for, and their salary, among other columns. 17 <laughs> columns altogether. You can download this, you can look at it, you can see how it changes for an individual employee year on year. So it's tying back to that very first transparency in the face of kind of corruption ethos that open data inherits from. The idea that you should be able to see what any public official is paid is like very much in line with that, like progressive transparency. I'd mentioned these are made publicly available. There's a data platform powered by Socrata. You can get to it most easily. You can just Google, you can search for whatever your preferred search engine is, or you can go to nyc.gov data. I usually do that because it's shorter. Yeah. yeah. So the 
how do you get thousands of data sets updated, uploaded, updated, kept up to date, adequately described, stuff like that? How do you do that across uh, like tens of agencies, commissions, things like that? So you have to have into you have to have individuals responsible for it. And here, the open data law specifies that you have to have open data coordinators in each of these. And that's their job. They review the open data, they review data sets for whether they should be published. They specify practices for updating them and so on. All right, so we've learned about some of the history of open data and what open data is, but how do we access it? As mentioned, we have this portal. So if you go to nyc.gov slash open data, or if you search for that, you'll be brought to this page. Um, so we're going to explore this and learn more about how to actually navigate this page and how to pull data from it that you can use. So to start, we have this search bar. So if you come onto the site and you have an idea in your head of what you're looking for, you can just go in and search for a certain data set specifically, but you might not know what you're looking for. So at the top of the page, you're going to see this data box. So if we click here, that's going to bring us to this nice navigation page. The way I like to view this is like my seamless little hub. Maybe I'm not sure what I'm in the mood for dinner that night. Maybe I don't know what data set I want, but we have a lot of options. So we can navigate them by agency. Maybe I want to look at what the DOT is collecting, right? I can look at categories, so business, city government, et cetera. Or maybe I want to see what's popular. What are other people looking at? What's a hot new data set out there? That's going to be the place to go. Or we can see what's new. So there's new data sets being added constantly. I don't, I don't have an exact number for that, but you can come here and see new sets of data that are regularly added or updated. And it's really interesting. Every time I come on here, there's a new data set that I've never been aware of before. Even this morning, I spoke to somebody who told me about a data set of rats in New York City, which I don't know if I wanted to know about that, but it exists and you can find that on here. So there's a lot of interesting things you may or may not be aware of that you can explore. So we're going to go through an example of pulling up a data set. So in this slide, um, we're back on that home page where we have our search bar, and we're going to be looking up a 311 data. If you're not aware of 311, um, 311 um, is New York City government resource for assistance and general in information outside of emergency situations. So it's an emergency, you'd be calling 911. Everything else, you'd be calling 311. And they're open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and they're available in over 175 languages for roughly 3,600 government services. So they're collecting a lot of points of data and they're accessible in many different ways. The way I had always heard of them was via phone, you would call 311, but through this training I learned you can actually reach them through web, Skype, Twitter, Facebook, um, they have an app. So they're collecting data in many different ways from many different people. So once I typed in 311, hit enter, I got the search returned um, 43 results of 311 data sets. So we're going to explore this first one here, 311 service requests from 2010 to present. And once I open that, I'm just going to go back. So when you click the title of it, it'll bring you to this kind of about page. And on here, we can really just learn more about the data set. And each data set's going to be a little bit different. They're not all collect, the data is not all collected in the same way. Each agency does different and unique things. So you always want to start here and figure out what we're looking at before we really dive into it. So some key things to note. At the bottom, we have what's in this data set. Just to get like a good overview, we're going to quickly learn there's 27.5 million rows of data. So that's a lot. And each row of data is going to be a service request. So a request that somebody put in with 311. And then some important things to note before we dive in are when was this when was this data set last updated? These slides were made back in January, so likely the most likely thing is that this data set is more up to date now, but at this point in time the last date it was updated was January 11th, 2022, and the frequency that is updated is daily. So if we looked at this live on the internet right now, that would be updated to the 4th most likely unless they're backdated a bit. And then you can see how many views and downloads this has. So a lot of people are accessing this data, over 400,000 views and downloads. And the next thing we're going to explore a bit more, you'll see on this page is a data dictionary. So this is going to be a link, and it's going to take us to a beautiful data dictionary. Um, and if you're not familiar with a data dictionary, this is going to be breaking down what your data in your data set is. So. This column name is telling you what all of the columns in your data set are. And then the description is going to actually describe what, what that means. And it seems straightforward, but a lot of times these column names aren't as 
um, obvious as you might think they are. You might just have the wrong information in your head. Sometimes I'll see create a date and maybe I think that's when the data set was created, but it's actually when something else was created. So you should always just go through and review that. Do you know what you're working with later on? And it's important to note here, this one's really thorough and it's really nice. Not all the data dictionaries are gonna be the same. If you come into one and you maybe still have some questions, there's a page on the open data portal where you can ask for assistance or help. And you can always put in a request to maybe get some more information if there's anything you're unclear about. Cause really the most important thing is understanding the data you're working with. Otherwise you might come to the wrong conclusions later down the road. Yes. Just like uh, one, one example of why this might be useful. If you look there on row nine, that's the status. It shows some the list of expected values. So this is really useful information if you are, say, trying to filter and don't want to just dig through the actual data set values to see what uh, a field values a field can take. Not all data dictionaries have it, but they're uh, in the process of enhancing them, improving them so that uh, they'll be able to uh, be used in that kind of way. All right. Yeah. So once you have a good understanding, I'm going to go back to the previous page, the about page, and let's actually take a look at that data. At the top of this page, you'll have a few options. Um, we're going to start with the one that's boxed, the view data option. And we'll go back to that slide in a second. Um, when I load my data, we're just going to come to a, a table. And like we learned earlier, there's millions of rows of data. There's many columns. We're not seeing all of them here. So this is a lot to work with. So we're going to filter our data and we're going to make this a more manageable size. That way we can not be just overwhelmed with millions of rows of data. So on the right hand side, you'll see it's already highlighted. We have this filter button. So when I click, that's going to allow me to just break down this data a bit. So in this example, we're going to, sorry, bear with me. We're going to go to this filter box. And we're going to set a little query here. So in this example, we're taking community board and we're making that equal to Queen's community board one. So this is going to take my 27 million, million rows of data and reduce it just to rows that occurred in Queen's CV1. And when we did that, you'll see that our results went from millions to now 500,000. So it's still a lot, but it's something a little bit more manageable. And what's pretty cool is you can add multiple conditions here. So our QB1 was a basic example. There's other um, parameters we can add in. So we've added in two additional ones. We've added a created date is after and put in January 1st as our timestamp. And then we added an agency field. So this will now narrow it down to results that were created after January 1st and anyone that fell into the jurisdiction of the DSNY. And when we did that, I think we now have a nice number of 289 results. Um, it's a little small, but that's a more manageable number. And now we can actually do some analysis from here. So now that we have this, go back. So now that we have this filtered data, there's a few things we can do with it. So we're gonna come here. The a really simple one that you can always start with is just simply exporting that data. So we have this table of filtered data. I wanna export it and just put it on my own computer and do my own analysis from there. If I click that export tab, you'll see we have a few different formats such as CSV, JSON, et cetera. You can select which one you're interested in and export your data from there. And then you can do whatever you want with it. I can put it in Excel, do some fun things in there. I can put it into any visualization tool. The world is your oyster. But what's really cool, say we don't wanna do this on our own computer, in our own framework. This portal also allows us to visualize the data directly on the site. And this is a really, really cool and powerful tool. So if we jump back to that original about page for this data set, you'll see we have this visualize button. Um, if you click that, it'll bring you to a visualization tool directly on the NYC open portal, open data portal. And this is really powerful. It's similar to Tableau or all this other software, which is normally really expensive. And this is all available for you just to use open to the public. So we're going to just do a quick example with that same 311 data set. So in this example, we're going to start, and you'll see at the top, we have this box. This allows you to choose how you'd like to visualize your data. So in this example, we have this little pie box selected. So we're making a pie chart. And you'll see that there's a lot of examples that we have row and bar charts and some scatter plot, a globe. So we can make some fun maps later on. So here we're doing a pie chart and we're again, just filtering that data. So we're going to look at any service requests that came in on March 21st, 
2021. And then we're going to aggregate that data. So on the left, we have some ways to break down our data. So it's visually makes sense to us. So in this case, we're going to aggregate the data by borough and we're going to be looking at account of records by borough. So we'll, we start to see where are the most requests coming from in this time frame. So you'll see Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan all have a lot of requests coming in here. And so if we go back, like I mentioned before, at the top, we have a few different ways we can visualize data. This is probably my favorite, but we have this map at the top. And this allows you to plot um, your data. So if your data has a spatial ties to any spatial data in it, we'll be able to plot it on a map. So in this case, we're looking at records that were created um, yesterday, which would have been ja back in January at this point. And we're just simply plotting each record. So where did, where is that request coming from? And so you can see a nice distribution of where people are submitting 311 requests throughout the city. And again, this is all, all available for you on the website, which is really cool. And the last example we'll do here is we're just looking at a bar chart set up the same way. We selected the type of visualization we wanted at the top. We added a filter for requests that were going through the DOT and we added a time frame. And then here on the left, we have it aggregated by complaint type. So we have how many complaints are coming in for each type of request that the 311 center gets. And so here we can see that our top request at this time was street conditions. So something was going on with the streets at that time. All right, sorry for jumping through a bit. So there's other visualization tools you can explore here. Um, I recommend everyone check it out. It's really fun to just play around and see what you can do here. And if you're ever in need of some inspiration or just looking to explore more, on the Open Data site, there's a project gallery with different online tools that other people have made, all using open data from this portal. So you can navigate to this, and I'm not gonna go back to it, but if we, the link's right there at the top, but you can navigate to this from the Open Data site as well. There's a selection at the top of the page. And this is really cool just to get like your creative juices flowing. There's a lot of really interesting ones. The Squirrel's Tales one is definitely recommend checking that one. There was a squirrel census done and you can see where all these squirrels live in, in the park and what they're up to. And if you ever use this data and create a tool that you think might be useful for others, you can submit it. There's a few requirements, but you can submit it to the open data site and your tool can be published here as well. In addition to that, we there also exists a collection of maps so the URL is at the top, nyc.gov slash map. And this is very similar. Um, these are created by city agencies, though. And it's another way to make this data more accessible to the public. And there's a lot of really neat ones you can explore. These are a few examples. One that I like is a map of snow plows and the progress that they're making throughout the city. It's pretty useful. And again, that's all just made with data that is publicly available. Yeah, one of my favorite of those visualizations, just to briefly pack back, is it's, it's dark, but like, with Vision Zero, like the, I believe the police department publishes information on each vehicle crash and like the type of vehicle, where it occurred. And mapping those can help identify like where hotspots are, where additional enforcement or might be needed, stuff like that. That's pretty cool. That one's, what's it called? It is called the NYC Crash Mapper. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's, but yeah, yeah, you can find that and a whole bunch of others on that. So it's the fire hose, right? Like, <laughs> Where do you get started? Uh, a lot of the time, as just mentioned, you can just explore, look at what data sets are there. Other times you might come in with some problem that you want to solve and you want to see how open data could be applicable to helping you solve it in an informed way. Uh, so we're offering this framework as just a rubric to help with that kind of exploration or that kind of uh, inquiry. For the more exploratory stuff, like you get into the world of research, how do you even find a question is, can be a very involved activity, but yeah. So for when you actually have a problem, then you can take a bit more of a pragmatic. As you can see here, we have just five, five categories or steps or like stages for solving a problem with open data. And we're going to go through an example of that, but before I do that, it's a, uh, no, I could just continue. Yeah. So here we have this scenario. You're working for an agency that wants to support restaurants specifically by giving them money, small grants and loans. And the question, first question you're interested in is who should you give money to? Which restaurants exist? Which restaurants uh, need funding? Stuff like that. So here 
This corresponds to the stage of defining the problem and understanding the stakeholders. When you have done that, when you say, I want to, I'm interested in restaurants, I'm interested in restaurants maybe in some specific region, I'm uh, interested in restaurants that may need assistance, the it, it's, it can be time to start looking for data sets. This is also somewhat exploratory to figure out what data sets on the open data platform are applicable to your problem. One way to do that could be to just search. Do you have any guesses? Anyone have a guess what you might find? What's an interesting data set about restaurants? Uh, those are good answers. So you might want to say limit assistance to restaurants that have good ratings or bad ratings if they need more assistance. So it's it's certainly something you could explore. You By searching for related keywords like businesses and restaurants, you'll get a bunch of interesting ones. Like applications for opening restaurants is possibly interesting. And you can see here, there's a bunch of interesting, relevant data sets. And there's the open restaurants inspections, like you mentioned right there, the third one on that list. Based on the data that's available, you might next proceed to more specific questions that you can answer using the data that help you refine your approach. So that first one, it related to ratings, what uh, restaurants got an A rating in the last year? Which ones have already received support, in this case, as part of a business acceleration program? Which ones are the largest employers? Which ones are heavily trafficked areas? And these are actually all questions that you can find information about, answer in ways that you have to be careful about, as we'll see later, using open data data sets. So that's very, like, to elaborate on that last one, if you're looking at the business acceleration program, which from the overview sounds like it might be closely related to what you're interested in. If you dig into the data set information and the detailed description, uh, the data dictionary, you can see that it actually doesn't quite correspond. You're not reproducing the work that this other program already uh, is doing. This one only provides in-kind support as opposed to grants and loans. If a data dictionary isn't enough to tell you whether the contents of a data set are applicable to your question, then that contact us link on pretty much every NYC Open Data page takes you to the help desk where NYC Open Data staff will find the answer to your question. Uh, it can take some time, but generally you can expect it to be within days to two weeks. Continuing to the inspections, we might be interested in restaurants that are receiving A ratings like we had asked earlier. So. Digging into the data dictionary, we can find out who the business is, what kinds of violations they've had, and what their overall grades are. The data dictionary tells us what those fields mean in some ways. You can see here that, for example, this, oh, no, this is not the data, this up columns in the data set page. So next, you, once you've identified columns that might be interesting, you go to the data dictionary. And you would, for example, using the visualization tool, you could plot the kinds of complaints that were common. So here you can see that the most common category for compliance here in the Bronx is that they simply skipped. Generally, you want to summarize the data rather than just looking at the raw rows in some fashion. And the two most consumable ways tend to be tables and charts. Tables don't necessarily get enough love, in my opinion. I think they're really information dense, but Charts, like the picture can be worth a thousand words. Some pictures are worth more, some less, but a good visualization can also convey the information to your stakeholders in a really concise, rapid way. Visual processing is much faster than reading. Returning to the uh, question at hand, uh, another visualization you can use here, you can see is uh, actually plotting the ratings. And now you find to your dismay that the majority of restaurants simply don't have a rating. This is one of the reasons you want to examine the data, see what's actually there, look at the data dictionary, uh, stuff like that, because you don't want surprises like this to completely undermine your analysis. With that information, you probably would not want to use ratings as one of the inputs, simply because they're missing for most of the cases, or not most, or a plurality of the cases. Yeah, like I said, once you have analyses, you can provide recommendations, you can provide information, or if you're the decision maker, you can make the decision yourself. With that information, you probably would not want to use ratings as one of the inputs, simply because they're missing for most of the cases, or not most, or a plurality of the cases. Yeah, like as your civic technologists and the like. And 
if you're interested in data that isn't already public, you can request it again via the contact us page. If you like, if you want to see what other people have done, you can look at the Open Data Project Gallery. If you've made your own, you can submit your projects to the Open Data Project Gallery. And you're all here. You're all here for the School of Data, which is kind of the, one of the culminating events of uh, Open Data Week, the celebration of the anniversary of the Open Data Law. Uh, there's a lot of other events uh, that have that have been part of Open Data Week, everything from data-oriented art to other NGOs to seminars. A lot of good stuff. Open Data Week, you're all here. Any questions? One other thing I'll add is we're both part of a volunteer program to where we learned about this and shared it with, and we're going to share, continue sharing it with the public. And they do cohorts every year where you get trained and then give similar presentation. If that's of interest, you can always get involved that way as well. Just wanted to add that. Joint events the entire t today. There, there's the kickoff today, and then events through Sunday the 13th. Uh, for the and if you want to join the Open Data Ambassadors program and become an Open Data Ambassador yourself, like Laura and Natarajan, you can visit nyc.gov/slash teach open data. In terms of integrity of the data, there are some questions. What would be the best way to go about it in terms of? Should we contact normal link to contact open data or agency or what would you say? My suggestion would be going to the help desk portal. Oh yeah. If you're unsure of the integrity of the data set that you're working with, what's the best next steps to take? My suggestion is always go to that open data request or uh, the help contact page and you can put in a request there. And that's being um, responded to in a prompt time. So you'll get an answer from somebody who's like at the source. Yeah. I'm not sure if you guys already covered this, but I was just wondering, like, personally, how you became a bit of data ambassador. Is it what brought you into doing this kind of work? Yeah. I attended a few panels at last year's Open Data Week. And I don't, I didn't attend this one, but I've worked with Open Data personally. And I think it's a really cool resource. And I actually don't remember how I learned about the program, but it was probably just through wandering around. The open data set for a lot or the open data portal and websites and looking at those tools i learned about it and thought it was a cool opportunity yeah for my part i like i mentioned the open data ambassador program started in the run-up to census 2020 i got involved with that because at the time i was working on public statistics at google so if you search for things like employment in california or uh population of new york city the little chart that comes up we my team like end to end, like talking to census bureaus and governments around the world, NGOs like the UN. So I was really interested in open data, public statistics. And I guess I knew about it. I learned about the program because I followed one of the, or several of the people involved with starting it on Twitter. So I heard about it that way. That time is up. Okay. All right. Thank you all for attending. I hope you found this interesting, informative, and enjoyable.